Town Hall tonight, folks. 60 minutes of fun and music brought to you by Ipana Toothpaste and Salapatica. Ipana for the smile of beauty. Salapatica for the smile of health. Fun with Curtis Soupnagel and Bud. Music with Peter Van Steeden. And another big amateur contest. New voices, new music, new fun. It's Town Hall tonight. Yes. Bounding about like the grateful gazelles they are, throwing bombos to the crowd right and left. It's a big night tonight, so hurry, hurry, hurry. Everybody's going. Everybody's going. Here's Fright Week Upjump, the famous journalist. Where are you going, Mr. Upjump? I'm telling the Colonel's interview tonight, Ronzel. I want to see down in front. Fantastic whistle. Why aren't you in the hall, Mr. Whistle? I'm supposed to get the final result of the Colonel's campaign tonight. I want a seat way in the back. And here are Colonel Stubnagel and Bud themselves. What's new, fellas? Hi, Harry. We're getting out our gats to take a few shots at gangbusters tonight. Some shooting, huh, Colonel? What's that? Yes, sir. A big show tonight, folks. So come on, come on. Everybody's going. Everybody's going. <laughs> Sir, here we are inside the old town hall, all ready to begin the big show. Featuring tonight a scintillating interview with a little man of industry, the final results in the Colonel's campaign, and a stoop nail and Bud Burlesque of the popular Gangbusters series. But Peter is signaling that he's all set for the overture, and we're off. Four jangles of Harlem. Let it go, Peter! <laughs> Myers Company, makers of Sal Hepatica and Ipana, have been the most undissatisfied sponsors we've ever had, hadn't they? Ah, you bet, Colonel. And seriously, if they wanted us to do this same thing over again for the next summer, I like them so well, I'd do it for nothing, wouldn't you, Bud? Why, certainly. Sure. <laughs> I'll get that. Yeah, all right. Hello? Yes, this is the Colonel. Bristol who? <laughs> You're not interested, I see. Well, goodbye. <laughs> Uh, what'd they want, Colonel? I couldn't hear a word the guy said. <laughs> well, maybe they were congratulating us on our new show. New show? Yeah, yeah, next Sunday afternoon. On the radio with a sponsor and everything? Well, of course it'll be on the radio. Certainly. Goody, 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 then. Well, why all the goodies? I've got a radio. I'll listen in. Oh, it's a good trick if you can do it. Now, look, Colonel, I wish you'd sort of give us a few of your new inventions and definitions. Huh? Boy, I was hoping you'd ask me for those, but I've been working on a thing I call my sub-trailer. Sub-trailer? What's that? Sub-trailer, believe me. Well, it's a sort of a 
It's a sort of a trailer that goes on behind the regular trailer that trails along behind your car when you take a trip and take a trailer along for a trailer trip. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm afraid you've caught me in a lie, Colonel. Yes, I know what you mean. What's the sub-trailer for? Well, that's so you can uh, take some other people along with you in it. Oh, I think that's fine. The other people are an invention, too. Oh. Yeah, I... they're, they're so you can have people along to borrow stuff from and to talk about. I see. Uh, uh, then, uh, inside, inside of the regular trailer, I have a telephone to save you money. Now, wait, wait just a minute. How can you save money by having a telephone in a trailer? Well, when you think you want to call somebody up, you go ahead and call them up, see? But you can't get them because the phone isn't connected, so that's uh... where you save money. <laughs> Why, listen, last year alone, I know a fellow who saved enough money that way to set his son up in business. Uh, what business? The business of selling telephones to trailers that aren't connected, so you can't call and therefore you save yeah, enough look, to set look. your son up. My stars, to... Colonel, how under the sun you ever think a silly stuff like that is beyond me. Star, son, that reminds me, bud. I've got a series of definitions for the sun and for the stars and for the rain and the moon that'll slay you. Uh, you Want to hear them? I was afraid of that. Definition for the sun, rain, yeah. moon, and stars, huh? Uh-huh. Well, if you promise to let Peter play afterwards, go ahead. Well, well, the sun is stuff that you get burned from it. Uh-huh. Rain is stuff they call ball games on account of. Yeah. The moon is what some mountain has been trying to get up over Kate Smith all this time. Yeah. And the stars, oh, the stars. Uh, what are they? Stars are things that twinkle, twinkle, little, how I wonder what you. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All last week, the colonel was hard at work, as you heard, in his laboratory on Observatory Hill. And out of a veritable maze of things and stuff has come something. Would you like to explain it, colonel? Try and stop me. It's an invention for brushing your teeth, Harry. Uh, first, you take a nice, new, big, round brush, and you attach it to your typewriter carriage. Then you sit down at the typewriter, press your teeth to the brush, and spell out how many petals has a daisy. The, uh, the brush moves along, and... The, well, you colonel, uh, what's the matter with a toothbrush? Oh, they've been invented? Well, then that takes care of everything. Right? Oh, no. No, not exactly, Colonel. Because seriously, ladies and gentlemen, just brushing your teeth is never quite enough. You've got to take care of your gums, too. Any dentist will tell you the teeth are seldom white and sparkling when gums are soft and tender. That is the reason so many dentists recommend Ipana toothpaste. Because Ipana not only makes your teeth cleaner and more brilliant but when used with massage, has the extra advantage of helping tone and stimulate your gums. Just do this. Every time you brush your teeth with Ipana, put a little extra Ipana on your brush or fingertip and massage it into your gums. In that way, you'll give your gums the toning and stimulation they need to help guard against serious gum trouble. And at the same time, you'll have cleaner, whiter teeth. So always remember Ipana for the smile of beauty. <laughs> Steven and the Ipana Troubadours playing Bye Bye Baby. Now we present the final chapter in the historic campaign to keep Stoopnagel out of the White House. Keep him out of the White House. You can tell what he might do. Let's find a place for him in a lighthouse. Oh, 
Oh, maybe we could put him in a zoo. A special election of the voters is being held today all over the United States to determine whether or not we shall have Stoop Nagel in the White House or out of it. And the jittery candidate sits in his campaign headquarters at Crawling on the Hudson, New York, as reports come in from every nook and cranny of the country. Bud, who has stood by our candidate through thick and thin, high, wide, and handsome, black and blue, and fire and water, is pacing up and down as telegraph machines bring in the news. Why? Quiet, quiet, quiet here. Whatever you're doing, drop it. Nice dropping, boys. Now, in a second or two, we expect a report from California. Stand by. Well, here it is now. San Francisco, California. From 456 out of 200 precincts, final tabulation. Colonel Lemuel Q. Stubnagel of New York, no vote. Oh! Congratulations, yeah. Colonel. Not a single vote from California. Thank you, Mr. Fiddlestuffer. Thank you. My, but I'm excited. Maybe I won't get into the White House after all. <laughs> hey, is this a campaign headquarters for keeping White Nagel out of the stoop house? I got a message for you. Uh, hooray, man. Listen to this. It's from Dallas, Texas. It says, practically complete reports from 678 out of 200 counties here. Gives Stoop Nagel no votes and his opponent 456,678. It looks as though I have a good chance of not winning. Oh, boy. Hey, my goodness, what's this? What's hey, this? Colonel, Colonel, they're bringing the Alabama votes in here in an armored car. Here comes a right. man up the stairs with them now. Alabama, 24 votes for Underwood. Ah, uh, well, that's fine, boys, but how about Stoopnagel? Who's Stoopnagel? <clears throat> I'll get that phone, man. Now, quiet now. Hello, campaign headquarters for keeping Stoopnagel out of the thing. Still speckle nagling. Oh, hello, Ma. Yeah, it's a fine fight, Ma. Yeah, I hope, uh, hope to lose any minute now, Ma. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be right home, Ma. Goodbye. Uh, who is that, Colonel? My father. He wanted to know about the mortgage. <laughs> hey, hey, shut that door. Oh, my gosh, that's ice cold wind coming in there. Uh, sorry, sir, but you'll have to stand it for a moment. The Alaska vote is coming in. The vote from Alaska. Well, now, this is fine. I am Captain Bob Carson, folks. And I have come here on my little ship to Norris, these many long miles between here and the coast of Alaska. There was a vast amount of interest in the voting, and Stoop Nagel is a vast favorite up in the vast stretches of the world from North Country. Yeah, well, how, uh, how was the voting, well, Captain Menace? Well, how was the voting, Captain? We're all anxious to know, you know, as the thing is pretty close here in the United States. Every person voted this year, and it was just fine. As nice a compliment as I ever paid to any candidate. Yeah, well, uh, who, uh, <laughs> who won up there, Captain? Well, Stuart Nagel is a great favorite up there. Everybody yeah, in Captain, the vote. Captain, Captain, hey, please, look. Huh? What was the final count of the vote? Everybody likes Stuart Nagel up there. When we were going... Wait a minute. Wait. How many votes did Stoop Nagel get? Minus 42! <laughs> Say, uh, Harry. Harry. Yeah? Uh, during all this confusion, have any results been coming in from the other states of the Union? Yes, but we've got them. Attention. The total vote. Other candidates, 13,567,000. The lot, two. Colonel Stoop Nagel, one. A vote for me? A vote for me, Harry? Yes. Why, well, I've been double-crossed. The very idea. Give me that phone. Hello, officer. <laughs> Give me Rhinelander 4, 4, 4, 2, 2. Hello, Ma. Ah, oh, gee, thanks, Ma. <laughs> Now the Town Hall Quartet, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight the boys revive a great favorite of a season or so ago, Louisiana Hayride. Look for the oyster and die for the clam. Now for the home in the happy land. Is everybody here now? Yes, yes indeed. indeed. Well, that being the case, I'll now proceed. What kind of fun does your fancy most? Picnic? No, sir. Oyster supper? No, sir. Strawberry festival? No, sir. What kind of fun does your fancy most? You have to get but your mind close. Don't hold it back any longer. It's a hayride. Yes, yeah, sir. It's going Louisiana hayride. Louisiana hayride, no use for calling the road. Oh, I like that song, the dipping in the hay, for loving it away. Oh, oh, all the time it's short, crackling with, catch a little kiss to go. Start something, Louisiana hayride, no fooling, we all is happy, get going. 
Louisiana, he rides. No use for calling the road. Maybelle Emmeline. Yeah, I hear. Susan Cannonball. I hear too. Bambo Washington. I'd right here, brother. He's from the Kinley. I'll hear. Yeah. Evan Potter. Carolina Donna. Hmm, boy, they've all here. Marinda, Flora, and Linda. Yes, sir, brother, we've all here. Francis Abraham. I'll hear. Moses Abraham. Are you here? We all here. You can see. We all here. So get going. Louisiana, he's right. Oh, get going. We all is ready. Oh, stop, stop. Louisiana, he's right. Oh, no use to call in the road. Oh, I like that boat. Sitting in the hay. And loving it away. Oh, for the time is short. Crack a little whip and get your little chip to go. So start some Louisiana hayride. No fooling, we all is happy. Get going, Louisiana hayride. So you for calling the road. Get going, Louisiana hayride. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, boys. Tonight we're going to do one of those man on the pavement broadcasts. And just to make it a little more confusing, we're not going out on the pavement. As a matter of fact, we're not even going to ask questions. We're going to let Harry do it. That is, if he's found anyone who'll let him. Have you, Harry? Well, I think I have, Colonel. Uh, Mr. Payne, would you mind stepping up to the microphone, please? Right here. <clears throat> is this all right? Well, that's fine. Now, let's see how good you are on observation. Tell me, are the pupils of most of your friends' eyes blue or brown? Gee, I don't know. Uh, offhand, uh, I'd say blue. I see. Would, would you get mad if I told you they weren't any color? It's the iris that's color. Oh. <laughs> I didn't make a very good start, did I? Well, it's all in fun. Now, let's see how you are on grammar. What's wrong with this sentence? When you're feeling logy and under the weather, sal hepatica is ideal to take. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's right. And you'll find countless people who'll agree with you, too, including physicians who recommended sal hepatica for more than 40 years. Because when you're feeling headachy and under par, two things usually cause it. Waste in your body and acid in your system. And salopatica is the mineral salt laxative that not only removes waste from the body, but also helps nature combat acidity. So the next time you feel grouchy and under the weather, remember sal hepatica for the smile of health. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the colonel stepped off the stage a minute to finish writing last week's show. <laughs> so now I'm going to take this opportunity of interviewing one of our little-known men of industry. Will you come up the microphone there, Junior, please? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Come right up. Hello. Hello, <laughs> Hello Mr. Priddle. <laughs> Have I got that name right? Yeah, Priddle. Pyramid Q. Priddle is the whole name. Well, that's nice to know that. What do you do for a living, Mr. Priddle? What? I say, what do you do for a living? I pile of fruit in fruit store windows and pretty pyramids. Oh. Yeah, right. a lot on the bottom and yeah, that's good uh, on top. So that's you're funny. the guy who does that, right? Yeah. It must take quite a time to learn to put oranges and lemons and stuff in pyramids that way. Yeah, it does. I guess I was just a natural lad, though, so, you see. I was born in Egypt right under the very nose of the pyramids. You were, huh? Yeah, my mother was... But my father wasn't. But we lived there on the desert, and sometimes the sand blew in my eyes. But I don't mind the sand once in a while. Look at spinach. Yeah, spinach yeah. Is... Now, look. Spinach I know. Is... Wait a minute. I know all about that. Look at spinach. Yes, I've looked at it. It's yeah. pretty nice. Yeah, uh, it look certainly at it. is. Yeah. Look, sort of go slowly with it. We want everyone to understand what you're saying. Yeah, I get it. Have you ever been to Egypt? It's nice over there, up Nile and down in the tombs and stuff. Look, uh, did the Egyptian pyramids make you think of piling fruit in that form? No, they didn't have a thing to do with it. Nothing at all. <laughs> glad you spoke about them then. I yes. am too. Yes. If I were a pyramid and somebody spoke about me, I'd be glad too, because after all, a pyramid can't speak about anybody else, and neither can a sphinx. Most people think that, think that only the sphinx can say anything, but he's got a good press agent advertising, you know. Yeah, all right. The hen Look, cackles when the duck doesn't, but you use the hen's eggs, you don't. Quiet. Nobody uses the duck's eggs. Look, let's uh, forget the sphinx and get back to the fruit piled in pyramid form, shall we? Yeah, well, it was like this. I was putting fruit in the fruit store window, you see. I worked in a fruit store at the time. I, yes, you must have. Yeah. I must have. Oh, I was placing apples here and grapefruit here and oranges there and... Oh, oranges here and grapefruit over there. Well, anyway, a fellow named Joe Glutz. You know Joe. Oh, you? sure. Oh, great guy, Joe. Yeah, you bet. Nice boy. Yeah, Joe. Great fellow, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, Joe came along and he kept saying to me, bet on pyramids, bet on pyramids. Pyramid is a horse, you know. Yeah, nice fellow, Pyramid. You bet. Yeah, great guy. Oh, it's a great fellow, Pyramid. Yeah, Joe's a nice horse, too. Fine horse, Joe, yeah, yeah well... Pyramid said to me, bet on Joe. 
Hey, hey, I'm on my... Hey, who got me, man? Who? Come out, come out, where are we? Who got... Well, I'm back again. <laughs> well, anyway, while he was telling me to bet on this horse pyramid, I was gradually, unconsciously... What? Yeah, I was gradually, unconsciously... Yeah, I can understand the unconscious gra- part of it, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, I was gradually, without thinking, sort of piling up the oranges in the shape of a pyramid. Uh-huh. Well, Joe left, and suddenly I heard old frozen face coming. Are you the same fellow talking? Yeah, old frozen face. Yeah. Who is old frozen That's face? That's what I'm supposed to yeah, say. Yeah, he's the boss. His real name is Cold Map. We boys call him frozen face, but not to his face. Yeah, just to his frozen. Yeah, yeah. Right. But instead, instead of getting mad at me for shaping a pile like a pyramid, the boss gave Woody up with joy, ran to the phone, and called the bookie and put two bucks on pyramid to win. Well, did the horse win? Oh, it's a great race. A nice race. Oh, fine. Yeah, Joe's a nice oh, race. Oh, you bet. Those pyramids. Yeah, which oh, do you like best, pyramid or race? Oh, co- where was I? Now, look. <laughs> did pyramid win the race? I mean, that's what we're all interested so in. So now the boss has got me doing nothing else but piling oranges and grapefruit in the shape of pyramid in the window of the fruit store. Yeah, but what do you do meantime for recreation? Well, I've been trying a new style. I've been... Trying for months now to put the pyramid in the window upside down. Well, did you have any luck? Luck, you bet. The horse came in and paid five to one. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Peter Van Steeden and the I Panda Troubadours playing Begin the Begin. Now, Colonel Stoop, Nagel, and Bud present another of their popular burlesques of radio. Tonight, a takeoff on that well known network radio program entitled Gangbusters. Mr. Phillips Lord, when asked by the Colonel whether his permission might be granted, replied, uh, What can we lose? Which led the Colonel to believe that it was all right with Mr. Lord. So now, Town Hall takes pleasure in presenting that eminent criminologist, Colonel Gangual Q. Stoopbuster. And his partner, Bud, in a daring expose. Are you ready, boys? What What can we we lose? lose? Calling the police. Calling the G-men. Calling the trains. Calling the army. Calling the navy. Can't you hear me calling Caroline? Gangbusters, stories of the police of their unending crusade against crime. Sent to you every what you may call it at this time by Parcels Post and sponsored by that superb product, Voice Boinders. The only oatmeal with a true cornflake flavor. 
Gangbusters gives you nothing but the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. No fibbing. No fibbing either. Tonight, Phillips H. Lord will interview Police Chief Timothy Hay of the Puckering Valley Police to get the lurid details on the crime career of the vicious, atrociously horrible person, <laughs> but too sad, the slasher Thorax. But first, just let me tell you a few things about Feist Boinder. I have asked Mrs. Plush G. Stoker, a housewife, to answer this burning question for us. When you sit down to your breakfast in the morning, what is the first thing you do, Mrs. Stoker? I call upstairs to plush my husband and tell him to get the deuce down to breakfast or I'll brain the son of a gun. Thank you, Mrs. Stoker. No, oh, thank you, too. Well, here in the private office of Chief of Detectives sits Police Chief Timothy Hay of the Puckering Valley Police Force. Chief Hay has come by train, bus, airplane, and stagecoach all the way from Puckering Valley, five miles up the post road, to review with Mr. Lord the strange and inhuman career of Buck Tooth Pad the Slasher Thorax. So, Phil, it's up to you. Uh, thank you, Harry. And thank you, Phil. And uh, thank you for thanking me, Harry. Thank, thank you. Uh, Chief Hay, am I correct when I say that Buck Tooth was one of the nastiest criminals in the past uh, decade? No, I say in the past ten years. Yes, Mr. Lord, uh, Buck Tooth was beastly. He was a nasty man. He was a kidly devil. Uh, uh, deadly killer, huh, Chief? You said it. I said it. Uh, now, look, as I understand it, uh, you first saw Buck Tooth, uh, the... Your elbow off the script. <laughs> yes. You first, uh... You first saw Buck Tooth... Uh, begin again. You first saw Buck Tooth, uh, watching a uh, call... Third time you first saw Buck Tooth there, <laughs> The watch him call it thorax right up in Puckern Valley in 1892. Is that true? Yes, he was just a babe in arms at the time, Mr. Lord. Just a babe. Yeah, he was running around with his gun model even then. He was a cute little rascal, four months old. Well, thank you, that. Things have uh, happened since then, though, haven't they, Chief? Yes, Mr. Lord, much stuff has passed under the thing since then. <laughs> but so sad the slasher and his gun model were planning their career of crime. It was a hot day in August. August. <laughs> Two baby carriages parked next to each other in a no parking space. Birds were singing overhead. One baby, a boy, was speaking to another baby, a girl, in the next carriage. Go. A go. A go. A go go. How come you go me like a go go go? How come you go me like a go? Well, I can see that by that, uh, Chief Hay, that. Things were coming to a pretty pass, even at that early age. A couple of crooners, huh? Uh, then what happened? Well, P.L., we heard nothing until 18 years later. They caught him stealing peanuts from a peanut butter factory. Ah, oh, the old shell game, huh, Chief? Shucks. So, uh, buck tooth like peanuts, huh, Chief? So they say. There was a rumor around that he liked pecans, but they found he liked peanut butter. <laughs> uh, uh. Who's uh, writing your material now, Chief? <laughs> well, it was in a peanut butter factory. Buck Tooth and his pal were at the cash register when suddenly... Well, go ahead. Uh, that must have been an awful mess, uh, Chief. Uh, how many were killed? Well, sir, not a shot was fired. <laughs> Well, shut my mouth. Uh, what happened then? Well, he was sent up the river for ten years. The next we heard of him was the day after he went to Sing Sing. Of course, when he got out, he immediately went back to his old pals of the underworld. His best friend at that time was Cuthbert the Gouger. So now, Mr. Lord, we will have a scene where Thad the Slasher and Cuthbert the Gouger are entering a jewelry store with the idea of stealing jewels. A new idea. <laughs> Listen. Hey, easy, uh, easy, said the slasher, Thorax. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want the whole neighborhood to hear us? Ah, let up, Cuthbert the Gouger. I guess I know my business. Now raise the window and get inside. Okay, yes. Uh, <coughs> hey, I don't like the looks of the joint. Oh, shut up, shut up. Now, look, here's the gas register. Let's see, you push the little valve down. <laughs> hmm. Empty, huh? Well, I guess we gotta get the safe. 
Where is that safe? Have you seen a safe or... Oh, oh, oh yeah, here it yeah. is. Yeah, they keep the jewels well locked up. There's nothing like a safe for keeping jewels. Yes, and there's nothing so safe as eating price pointers. The oats that taste like cornflakes. Hey, hey, who is this guy? A copper? Ah, uh, he's just one of them radio advertisers. Go ahead and open the safe. He ain't gonna bother us. When your little boy comes home early from school in the afternoon after a hard day and he says, Mother, I'm hungry. What do you do? Tell him he can't have anything to eat until dinner time? Perhaps. But if you were a wise mother, you will say to him... Hand me that nitroglycerin. Uh, is that the end, Chief? Yes, that's the way it was told to me. Uh -huh. That makes a nice dull story, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. And yeah. now, uh, Harry, if you will, please, I'd appreciate it if you'd announce something about clues, which we always broadcast uh, at the end of our programming. All right, Phil. We now bring you several honest-to-goodness clues. Send in to us from police chiefs all over the country. A clue from the chief of police of Dandruff on the Knob, Nevada. We want information on Bud, another team known as Snagel and Bud, for grand larceny. When last seen, he was jumping off the top story of the Empire State Building with a piece of fly paper in his hand. If located, please gather up the pieces and lose them. A clue from the chief of police of puckering on the valley. Information wanted on the whereabouts of a man calling himself Colonel Stupnagel. He is about 200 feet high and weighs 38 pounds. When last seen, he was wearing umbrellas on his feet and carrying a pair of high button brown shoes above his head. If found, please notify... Please notify. What about his record? It's broken. It's broken. It's broken. It's broken. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, Harry. Yes, Bud? Say, since Fred Allen will be back next week, and since this is the last time we'll be on this program with you... The colonel and I want to know if you'll do us a little favor, will you? Why, certainly. What is it? Well, will you give us something to remember you by? You bet I will. What do you want? Well, one more talk about Ipana toothpaste. All right, boys. Ladies and gentlemen, always remember that Ipana is more than a toothpaste. Because when used with massage, Ipana also helps to tone and stimulate your gums. And that is mighty important, because dentists say... The many creamy, well-cooked foods we eat nowadays... Do not give our gums enough work to do to keep them firm and healthy. So they grow lazy and soft through lack of exercise and stimulation. And you can supply that stimulation by massaging your gums with Ipana. Put a little extra Ipana on your brush or fingertip and massage it into your gums every time you brush your teeth. And in that way, you'll give your gums the toning and stimulation they need to help guard against serious gum trouble. You'll have healthier gums, bright teeth, and a more attractive smile. If you'll always remember, I Panna, for the smile of duty. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Town Hall tonight will continue immediately following your station announcement. The Town Hall Amateur Contest. We have on our stage again tonight a group of anxious and eager amateurs waiting to compete in our weekly contest. Before Colonel Stubnagel and Bud resume their duties as hosts, let's start these folks off with a rousing town hall reception. <laughs> now, as usual in the proceedings of our contest, you and our studio audience will act as judges. Your applause, which will be recorded on our sound recording machine, will decide the winners of the first prize of $50 in cash and the second prize of $25 in cash. Now, here's Bud to introduce our first guest of the evening. Thank you, Harry, very much. First tonight, before us here in town hall, a young man from New York City, Bernie Kay. How are you, Bernie? How are you? Well, welcome to town hall. I understand that you're an impersonator. That's right. And uh, your nickname is Fats, huh? Right. Okay. Well, Bernie, uh, I want you to meet my partner over here. He's a <clears throat> little fat, too. You know <laughs> I'm the muscular one. <laughs> yeah. Well, Fats, listen, before we start, of course, I'm not going to say anything tonight. This is the last night we're on here. I'm not going to say a thing about the fact that we still believe that people have more fun than anybody because uh, I got a letter from my sister, and she said we use it too much, see, so I can't say it anymore. But this is the last time that we have these amateurs with us, and uh, we just say goodbye with regret. 
And in case anyone listening in doesn't know what goodbye means, uh, goodbye is what if you're just getting somewhere, hello is better than. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dear. You know, I I purposely didn't make that very funny because Fred Allen gets on next week and, you know, we don't want to be too hard to follow. (laughs) Well, here we are back to you again after that funny stuff. (laughs) Tell me, where do you come from, please? Well, I was born in Rockaway Beach, Long Island. Well, that's a nice place to be born in. Mm-hmm. Fred Allen was born. No, he wasn't either. He wasn't born over there. Uh, what, what did you used to do? What was your business? Well, uh, I got out of high school, and I went to work in a fur house. Fur house? What yeah. kind of fur? What skunk? Kind? Skunk? Well, mostly. Mostly skunk and probably a little mink and a few other things. Huh? Did, you do, did you ever do anything else? Weren't you in the fruit business or something at one time? Well, Just once. in a small way? Yeah, during the summer. That's so? I loved onions. Loved onions, then. You got, got tired of doing that, huh? Well, you have some of your families in the show business, too. Isn't that true? Well, in a way, yes. You have I a... have a cousin who's a master of ceremonies in Jersey. That's so? And uh, another cousin of mine is connected with RKO. Oh, really? Booking offices. Oh, that's grand. Well, now, Bud, you come and take uh, Bernie uh, and uh, ask him what he's going to sing and stuff. Yes, Will you? Yes, sir, Colonel. Well, Bernie, I understand that you're to... Uh... <laughs> quiet, Astaire, quiet. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> I understand, Bernie, that, uh, that you're going to offer impersonations of Herman Bing, the young man who sang in the picture that usually goes round and round, and the title of the song is the same. Right. And second, you're going to imitate Fat Swaller singing Shoeshine Boy. Correct. Bernie, go right ahead. Okay. I blow through here. And the mood goes round and round. And it comes out here, a high bell. I push the first bass down. And the mood goes round and round. And it comes out here. And then I push the middle bass down. And the mood goes round and round. Below, below, below. Billy, ho, ho, ho. Listen to the shells come out. Then I push the left bass down. And the mood that goes round and round, ooh, when it comes out here, that's Waller. Shoe shine boy, you work hard all day. Shoe shine boy, ain't got no to play. Every nickel has a lot, ooh, ooh, shine, shine, shoe shine boy. Now you find joy in the things you do. You shine, boy. Y'all seldom ever blue. You're content with what you've got. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, shine, shine, shoe shine, boy. Now the people look at you with scorn because your clothes are worn and torn. Still, you never whine. Who? Why you keep walking up and down the street? You're pleading with each one you meet. Say, brother, can you spare a shine? Oh, shoe shine, boy. Soon the day will come and shoe shine, boy. Soon a tune you'll hum. Every nickel helps a lot, who So shine, shine, shoe shine, boy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That was Bernie Kay of New York City, an impersonator. Now standing before me, two gentlemen, two young lads from uh, Astoria, Long Island. All right, fellas. What uh, what are your names, if you? Joe and Charlie Patello. Joe and Charlie Patello, and uh, you're equipped with uh, harmonicas, both small and large, huh? You know, my partner uh, claims he's an organist, and uh, I mean, uh, maybe uh, maybe is that anything, Colonel? Is a harmonica anything like an organ? Yeah, it's the same thing. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. A little different, boys. Uh... How are you, Tommy? I understand that you uh, are in a rather peculiar kind of a business, you two boys. Isn't that true? true. What do you do, please? Well, uh, we're uh, pitmen for the midget car races in the Madison Square Garden Bowl. Over in Long Island. That's right. You're pitmen, and uh, when the uh, cars break down or anything, they come around to you and you fix them? And fix them up as soon as possible. Fix them up as soon as possible. You don't play the harmonicas while you're fixing them. Well, well, they fix the car. Hey, bud. Yeah. You know those uh, little midget cars that these boys are talking about? Uh-huh. Uh huh. How do they go? How do they go? I mean, when they when you're over there watching, how do they sound? Quiz. <laughs> oh, that's marvelous. That certainly is nice. Boys, what are you going to play? Nagasaki, huh? Nagasaki. Nagasaki. Go to it, please.
story of Long Island. A harmonica duet and the Taz of a tune, Nagasaki. Now we have two uh, people standing before us here in town hall. A young lady by the name of Jane Thompson. Mm. Who, <laughs> who comes from the Bronx. And uh, a boy by the name of Robert Warren. Incidentally, Robert is a composer. And I believe tonight that he's going to accompany Miss Thompson. And Miss Thompson is going to sing one of Robert's songs. Uh, welcome to town hall. I understand you're from uh, Brookline, uh, Massachusetts, originally. Right. Well, it's nice having you here. And Miss Thompson was born in the Bronx. Mm -hmm, that's right. Well, it's nice having you both. Colonel, come in and meet a couple of nice people here. Hello, please. nice people. <laughs> How are you? We're glad to see you here. Uh, Bob, I just want to ask you a couple... You don't mind if I call you, Bob. Oh, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. You come from the Bronx and stuff, but where did you go to college, please? I went to Dartmouth. To Dartmouth, huh? Yes. Graduated when? 1936. 1936. I have a brother, Horace Stupenagel. Yes, he went there. He went to Dartmouth. He was the class of 23. Uh, Captain of the swimming team. Captain of the swimming team, yeah. I don't know if he's still there or not. I, I, I'm not sure. Well, this, this, tell me, uh, did you, have you composed any others besides the one you're going to play tonight? Well, yes. A few more or less. Did you, uh, would you might, would you want to mention any of them, or would you rather just say no. the one you're going to do? No, I'd just rather play it. All right, you're going to play, and uh, the young lady's going to sing. Yes. All right. So, what's the title of that, uh, Robert? The title is Get Off My Mind. Get Off My Mind. You go right ahead. Robert's going over the piano now. Robert Warren playing his own song, and Jane Thompson singing. All right. Someday I'd like to fall in love with someone who believes that love is not just a game, a temporary flame. You seem to think it's quite a sport, and I know that you're just the sort who'd play around until you found another heart who'd start embracing. Get off my mind before I find that I'm a fool in love. Lord above would never let me be with you on my mind. Stay away from me, for I can see that I'm inclined to fall. And that all would be just misery with you on my mind. You're the one who have your fun. When you are through with me And you're the soul Who tell me so And then one day You'd run away Get off my mind And stop reminding me That love is sweet I'm discreet And that's the reason I say get off my mind Thank you very much. Thank you. That was Gene Thompson, Robert Warren. Robert's own composition. Can't get you off my mind. All right. Now we really have quite a thing here, ladies and gentlemen. Quite a thing. <clears throat> Incidentally, all the way from Bermuda. Is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, and your names, please. Arthur Smith. Arthur Smith. And yours? May Smith. May Smith. Brother and sister, huh? Yes, sir. And from Bermuda. Yes, sir. And when did you get up from Bermuda? Uh, about... Six weeks ago. About six weeks. You didn't by any chance when you were in Bermuda see anybody with the name of Sylvester Weaver wandering around down there, did you? No, I never. Well, we, uh... <laughs> we have a production man uh, on our show here. Uh, he spent his vacation down there at a place called the Coral Island Club. Do uh, you know where the Coral Island Club is? Yes, sir. Did you ever go over and have fun over there? Yes. You know the boss of the place, Jack Jack Green? His real name is Jack Peacock Green. Yes, we know him. You do, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, that's Colonel. Yeah. They know Jack Green from Bermuda. They do. Too. The yeah. Coral Island Club, huh? Yeah. Boy, can we go there free. <laughs> oh. <laughs> By golly, we better. I want, just want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the two little folks we have here. Are you brothers and, brother and sister? Yes, sir. Brother and sister. Uh, two little colored folks and uh, very cute. The little girl has a little pretty little pink dress on and the little boy's all dressed up in long trousers and a bow tie and everything else. And they're going to dance. What are you going to dance? What kind of a... Uh, what are you going to do? What's the name of your song? Let yourself go. Let yourself go. All right, now go right to it. <laughs> Step slightly as a feather, not next of gold. Now, 
Bermuda, dancing and singing, let yourself go. Now coming up from Union City, New Jersey. Huh. Well, good old New Jersey, that's my home state. <laughs> yeah, Union City's the honor city tonight, too. I'm going to say. Uh, <clears throat> Harry Steiner. Harry, welcome to Town Hall. Thank you. A baritone. Incidentally, uh, that reminds me, sitting out in the audience is a very, very dear, an old friend of mine who comes from Asbury Park, New Jersey, and he's a baritone, too. Uh, Bill Jordan, he's sitting out in the audience, so I want you to do a good job because he likes baritone singers. He's quite a singer. Colonel, come in and meet somebody from my home state here. Hello, somebody from his home state. <laughs> How do you do? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, you, Jersey, huh? Right. Well, you know, Bud and I are going down to Atlantic City next week for for some party uh, given by the governor, or is that for the governor? It's, uh, for, I'm, well, I'm, huh? well, maybe it's, uh, I'm not quite sure whether it's for him or given by him. You're not, eh? No. Oh, gee, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, well, except it's, uh, we don't know who it's... It's for Hoffman, though. For Hoffman. All right, well, that's, what's that got to do with this fellow that's going to sing? Nothing. Well, the Hoffman's the governor in New Jersey, that's all. Oh. Well, all right. He's a governor. Let's, what, what's he going to sing? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, Harry, what are you going to You know, we don't want to make this too funny, you know. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, what are you going to sing, huh? One alone. One alone. Harry Steiner of Union City. All right, you go right ahead. <laughs> up on me, fellas. I'm a little touchy here. How are you? Uh, what is this? The, uh, the four, what is it again you call it? Blues the Blues Chasers. Well, welcome to Town Hall. Are you going to sing one of your own compositions, or, uh... No, it's not one of them. Don't be afraid to tell your mother. Don't be afraid to tell my mother, huh? Anybody's mother. Just don't be uh, afraid to tell your mother. Don't be afraid to tell my mother it's not one of your own compositions. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel, come in and speak to the Blue Blazers there, will you? All right, boys. If you don't mind, I'm going to ask you very quickly here just uh, what your names are. There's one fellow here named Hobson, somebody. What's your last name? Broadway. Broadway. Hobson Broadway. And you're the first tenor, huh? Where were you born, Hobson? Greensboro, North Carolina. Little, look, come a little closer, Greensboro, will you? North Carolina. And uh, where do you work now? Working in, in a drugstore? No, with a shoe repair. Oh, in a shoe repair. I got them a little mixed up here, yes. <laughs> uh, 
somebody. I've got to get after Uncle Jim. He doesn't give me the right dope on you fellas. Then uh, there's a second tenor here, Clarence Walker. That's my name. That's your name, and you got the guitar there. Yeah, huh? guitar. <laughs> second tenor, and uh, what do you do now, please? Well, I'm unemployed, Mr. Benson. Unemployed? Yes. Oh, I see. I thought you were in the uh, WPA. Yes, yes. Oh, you were? Yes, yes. Well, you can lean on that second <laughs> tenor there. And, uh, <clears throat> and the, next, the next man is Victor... Vic, Tynes. Victor Tynes. And you're the baritone, and uh, you were born down in Greensboro, weren't you, yes, Victor? Yes. And what's your present job? My present job is a bellboy. A bellboy. Out in Harlem, isn't it? Yes, sir. That's fine. And John Adamson? That's right. You're the basso. Basso. <laughs> basso profundo, huh? <laughs> and uh, what is your business? Messenger clerk. You're a, a messenger clerk. Well, that's fine. Now we got everything all set. A uh, colored male quartet, ladies and gentlemen, singing, Don't Be Afraid to Tell Mother. Okay. <laughs> Don't be afraid to tell your mother, afraid that she'll discover that you and I have planned a little home. Don't be afraid to tell her so, she must be told you so, or our lives we must live all alone. Boom, 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 boom. Boy, if you tell her that you love me, dear, boom, boom, boom. and I'll be waiting at your door, boom, boom, boom. don't you be afraid to tell your mother, boom, boom, boom. but if I have to wait around a year, I'll have to say I'm going away and never come back no more. Boom, boom, boom. Don't be afraid to tell your mother, afraid that she'll discover that you and I have planned a little home, I mean, that you and I have planned a little home. Boom, boom. If you just tell her that you love me, dear, and I'll be waiting at your door. But if I have to wait around a year, I'll have to say I'm going away and never come back no more. Don't be afraid to tell your mother, afraid that she'll discover that you and I have a little home, I mean. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was the Blues Chasers, a colored male quartet from New York, singing Don't Be Afraid to Tell Your Mother. And now, another instrumental group, ladies and gentlemen, the Arrowhead Swingsters, Angelo, Frank, and Mike, instrumental trio. They're going to do Tiger Rag. Before you begin, boys, the Colonel has uh, just a word to say to you. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Colonel. <laughs> now the Arrowhead Swingsters. Now let's get at that tag of rag. One, two, and right in there and play. Tiger Rag. That concludes our amateur contest, ladies and gentlemen. And now, if you'll excuse the colonel and me, we'll go over to the recording machine and get the results of your applause. Hey, wait just a minute, boys. Before you do, I just want to tell you how much fun it's been working with you on these programs. And speaking to Bristol Myers, our sponsors, I want to thank you with all sincerity for every hour of smiles you brought us during the summer. We all hope your new series of broadcasts will be the most successful you've ever had. And, ladies and gentlemen, may we also thank you for remembering the two products that have made every one of these programs possible. I pan a toothpaste for the smile of beauty, sal hepatica for the smile of hell. I pan a sal hepatica. All right, now, have you fellas got the results ready, or are you ready? Well, here they are, Harry. Ladies and gentlemen, our applause meter shows that your applause has been heaviest for the acts that have been called back to the stage. Now, as we call the names of these contestants, Harry will hold his hand over their heads, and you may applaud once again for your choice. 
Uh, proceed, bud, please. Well, friends, or Colonel, too, we have quite a surprise tonight. We have a triple tie. A triple tie. A triple tie. So we'll be a little tough picking, I suppose. But here we go. First, from the Bronx, New York, the impersonator who did The Music Goes Round and Round and Shoeshine Boy, Bernie Satch K. <laughs> Next, from Duluth, Minnesota, the boy of the instrumental trio who just played Tiger Rag, the Arrowhead Swingsters. And all the way from Bermuda, the brother and sister who danced and sang Let Yourself Go, May and Arthur Smith. <laughs> all right, Colonel, now what does the applause meter show? Well, here's the news, bud. The first prize of $50 in cash goes to the two little folks from Bermuda, May and Arthur Smith. And the... <laughs> the second prize of $25 in cash goes to Bernie Fat K. Congratulations to the both of you. Hold it, hold it just a minute, Peter, please. Ladies and gentlemen, Stu Nagel and Bud have an announcement to make about their town hall show next week. All right, boys, what's doing for next week? Oh, boy, are we going to have a terrific show on town hall next week, huh, Colonel? Yes, sir, the best show in months. Well, it sounds well, fellas. What is it? Fred Allen will be back. And so we close the town hall doors on the final show of the summer series in which Stu Nagel and Bud added so much to our hour of smiles. Join us again next week when Fred Allen returns for more hours of smiles in the Old Town Hall. Until then, good night. This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>